Good day students! So for this session, we are to talk about electrolytes. For our learning objectives, at the end of this lesson, you're all expected to determine the clinical significance of electrolytes, determine the physiology and clinical applications of each electrolyte, and lastly, correlate the causes and abnormal levels of electrolyte results. So what are electrolytes? So they are ions capable of carrying an electric charge. So remember, in our previous discussions, we have tackled about positive and negative ions. So it's basically important to remember this one because these electrolytes are classified as either cations or anions based on the type of charge that they carry and also based on how these electrolytes migrate in an electric field. So if they carry a positive charge, it is given that they would migrate towards the negative pole or negative terminal, which we call as the cathode. And if they are negatively charged, of course, they would migrate to the positive pole, which is the anode. So what I have here is the summary of the different electrolytes and their key functions. And of course, each of them will be discussed as we go through with this topic. But before that, let's have first the water balance and distribution in our body. So the human body has an average water content of 40 to 75 percent. And these values decrease as the person ages and also in terms of obesity. And if we compare the males and the females, physiologically we can say that women have lower average water content than men as a result of a higher fat content. And also, as what we know, water is the solvent for all processes in the human body. That's why it is called as the universal solvent. And it has this main function. So number one, it transports nutrients to the cells. So it can do its function because remember, 90% of the fluid portion of the blood is water. And also, it determines the cell volume by its transport into and out of cells. So in short, it balances the concentration of substances in and out of the cell to maintain the cell volume, like in the processes of diffusion or osmosis. Another one, water removes waste products by way of urine and it acts as a body's coolant by way of sweating. Now, for the water compartments in the body, we have first the intracellular fluid. So, this is a fluid found inside of our cell. And any fluid not contained inside of a cell is in the extracellular fluid compartment. So, this one. So, you have to remember that fluid shifts that occur during changes in hydration or in our intake of water can have a marked effect, particularly on the ECF. And in most disease states, loss of fluids occurs initially from the extracellular fluid. So like for example, in diarrhea, wherein there is a large uh, volume of gastrointestinal fluid that is lost. And also another example, we have the renal failure, wherein a large uh, volume of ECF may be excreted. So it is important to be able to estimate the volume of the extracellular fluid compartment and also the volume of fluid lost to initiate appropriate fluid replacement and of course to monitor fluid therapy. So first for the intracellular fluid, so this one, it is found inside of the cell and it is approximately 60% or 24 liters or two-thirds of the total body water. So we have the main electrolytes here, the potassium, magnesium, and phosphate. So if I were to il illustrate that one, for example, we have here our blood inside of a test tube. We centrifuge it and we have now the RBC that settles at the bottom. And of course, around it is the fluid portion of the blood, which is the plasma. So the main electrolytes found inside of the cell are the potassium, 
magnesium, and phosphate. So they are inside of the cells. So this potassium is a cation, also the magnesium, but the phosphate is an anion. But outside of that, in the plasma, we have also three. First, we have the main extracellular cation, the sodium. We also have the chloride. And of course, we have the bicarbonate. So that's for our intracellular fluid. So in short, 60%. So here, 60% of the total body's water is inside of our cells. And the rest is in the bloodstream or in our tissue fluids. For the extracellular fluid, we have three types. The interstitial fluid, the intravascular fluid, and the transcellular fluid. So again, these extracellular fluids, they are found outside of the cells. They're only 40% or approximately 16 liters or one-third of the total body water. And as what I have mentioned, the main electrolytes in this ECF are your sodium, chloride, and bicarbonate. So let's differentiate the three. So first we have the interstitial fluid. So when we say interstitial fluid, this is a fluid found between the cells and blood vessels. So for example, you have here your cells and surrounding that is your blood vessels. So we have here your blood vessels. So they are branching. So between the cells and the blood vessels, we have here what we call as the interstitial fluid. How about for the intravascular fluid? So intravascular, that means it is inside of our vasculature, inside of our vessels. So we have here the intravascular fluid, so inside these vessels. And the main fluid in the intravascular compartment is our plasma. So again, the main fluid in the intravascular compartment is the plasma. How about this one? The transcellular fluid. So the transcellular fluid is a fluid um, inside the epithelial, okay? Epithelial, epithelial lined spaces. So example of that, we have CSF, um, we also have pericardial fluid, and we have the fluids in our joints, we have the synovial fluids. So those are the differences between the extracellular fluid compartments, the interstitial, intravascular, and transcellular fluid. So here is the illustration showing the intracellular fluid, which is 60% of the total body water, so it's inside of the cell. And also, we have the interstitial fluid found between the cells and the vessels. And also, we have the intravascular fluid, which is mainly plasma. So they are both classified as the extracellular fluid together with another one, transcellular fluid, which is again found in epithelial line spaces. So we just have some notes to remember here. So first, about 30 liters of fluid passes from the blood to the tissue spaces daily. And the normal plasma is composed of 93% of water. Again, plasma is the main intravascular fluid, which is made up of approximately 93% of water. And the rest are solutes, such as glucose, lipids, proteins, NPNs, amino acids, and other ions such as, of course, electrolytes. Next one, the water content of plasma is 12% higher than that of the whole blood. And the retention of 3 liters of fluid in the tissues will result to a condition known as edema. Next one, deficiency of vasopressin causes 10 to 20 liters of water excreted daily. So this vasopressin, the other name of this is antidiuretic hormone. Next, salt content of the body is the main determinant of the extracellular volume. And lastly, our sweat contains about 50 millimoles of sodium and 5 millimoles of potassium. Next one, for the sources of body water, 
So, the water inside of our body, usually we take it through consumption or it is produced by metabolism. And as what we can see here, drinking is a major route of water intake. And for our um, water losses, normally an average adult would lose about 2,500 ml of water each day through, again, excretion. So, out of that 2,500 ml, so 1,500 ml is lost in the urine. So, through urination, it's 1,500 ml. And another 1,000 ml is because of insensible losses. So, when I say insensible losses, like in sweating or perspiration or exhalation of water vapor through the lungs or um, excretion from the intestine with fecal material. So those are the things in which we lose water daily. So um, how do we compensate for these losses? So of course, we consume water. And the average adult consumes about 1,000 ml of water a day. So that's the average water um, content or water level that we take in every day. And depending on the diet, another 1,000 to 1,200 ml of water enters the body from food. And of course, um, water is also generated as part of several biochemical processes. So we call this as water of oxidation. So just like this one, for every 100 grams of fats metabolized, so every 100 grams of fats metabolized, we have 100 ml of water is produced. And oxidation of 100 grams of carbohydrates, for example, will yield 60 ml of water. And lastly, we have 100 grams of proteins produces 44 ml of water when oxidized. So that's the sources of the body water. Now let us have the regulation of blood volume. So in this slide, we will discuss the process of renin and jotensin aldosterone system or the RAAS. So this RAAS involves the sympathetic nervous system, which is also involved in the stimulation of activities that prepare the body for action, such as increasing the heart rate, increasing the release of sugar from the liver into the blood, and other generally considered as a fight or flight responses. So this RAAS is important because once blood volume is regulated, it follows that the blood pressure and perfusion or what we call as the blood flow to all tissues and organs will also be maintained. Also, the regulation of both sodium and water is interrelated in controlling this blood volume. So if a person has a low blood volume or low blood pressure, then renin will be released from the kidneys. So again, if a person has low blood volume or low blood pressure, then renin will be released from the kidneys. So now, this activates the entire system of RAAS. So we have here the three organs that maintain the function of this entire system. So we have the kidneys, the liver, and the lungs. So again, once the person has this decreased blood volume or blood pressure, renin will be released from the kidneys, particularly in the juxtaglomerular apparatus of the kidneys. And once renin is released from the kidneys, it will send um, a signal to another organ, the liver, to produce another substance. This time, it is angiotensinogen. By the way, the other name of renin is angiotensinogenase. So let me write that one. So angiotensinogenase. So it's an enzyme produced from the kidney that will stimulate your liver. And now, once the angiotensinogen is produced from the liver, it will be converted to another substance. We call it as the angiotensin 1. So angiotensinogen is converted to angiotensin 1 by the renin. And this angiotensin 1 is still inactive. So it needs to be activated. So what will happen is that the surface pulmonary and renal endothelium will produce an enzyme. We call it as angiotensin 
converting enzyme or the ACE. So this ACE will now convert angiotensin 1, the inactive form, to its active form, the angiotensin 2. So this angiotensin 2 will now send signal to the sympathetic nervous system to generate its activity, such as increasing again the heart rate and increasing the blood sugar, so that our BP will also be increased to its baseline level. Next one, this angiotensin 2 will also help in the reabsorption of sodium and chloride and the excretion of potassium, and of course, the retention of water. Next one, it will stimulate the adrenal gland, so here on top of our kidneys, so the adrenal gland, particularly the adrenal cortex, to produce a hormone known as aldosterone. So just remember that this aldosterone has two main functions. So this aldosterone increases our sodium in the blood and decreases the potassium in the blood. So that means now, this aldosterone will help in the reabsorption of sodium so that it will, in, it will be increased in the blood. And also, the excretion of um, potassium, so it will be decreased in the blood. Another thing, this angiotensin 2 will also activate the process of vasoconstriction. So once the vessels are constricted, then it will increase the blood pressure. Remember, we have a low blood pressure here. Next, this angiotensin 2 can also stimulate the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland to produce another hormone, the antidiuretic hormone or the ADH. So this ADH mainly functions by stimulating the collecting duct of the kidney to reabsorb water. So in short, when we have um, increase ADH that will lead now to increase water level and if we have low ADH then we will have a low water level so if these functions are already maintained if the blood pressure and the blood volume are already already returned to its baseline level then it will send um, a negative feedback to the kidney to stop the production of renin so that's how the RAS works now, for the major electrolytes of the body, let's have first the sodium. So, sodium is also known as natrium and it's the most abundant extracellular cation as opposed to potassium, which is the major intracellular cation. So, for example, we have here our cell. So, outside, again, we have sodium as the major extracellular cation and potassium, which is the major intracellular cation. Cation. So that means the concentration of sodium in the ECF is much greater than the ICF, whereas this potassium is greater inside the cell. And take note that this sodium and potassium can readily diffuse through the cell membrane. So they can diffuse in and out of the cell. So the two sides of the cell would eventually reach equilibrium. And in order to prevent this equilibrium from happening, active transport system such as the sodium-potassium ATPase pump, okay, so sodium-potassium ATPase pump. So this is a type of active transport system. So this pump would move three sodium ions, so three sodium ions out of the cell and exchange for two potassium ions into the cell as this ATP is converted to ADP. Another one, sodium largely determines the osmolality of the plasma. So osmolality, we will tackle that in the laboratory, but for the meantime, just take note that this osmolality reflects the ion concentrations in our blood. And the normal plasma osmolality is approximately 295 millimoles per liter. And 270 millimoles per liter is because of sodium and other associated ions. And take note, wherever sodium goes, water follows. So, the sodium can regulate water balance in the body and its plasma concentration depends greatly on the intake and excretion of water. And because water follows sodium across the cell membranes, 
the continual removal of sodium from the cell prevents um, osmotic rupture of the cell by also drawing water from the cell. So that's how the sodium maintains the ions and the water levels of our body. For the reference ranges, we have um, 135 to 145 millimoles per liter or 135 to 145 MEQ per liter. So this is for the serum sodium. For the CSF sodium, so in the CSF, we have 136 to 150 millimoles per liter. Next one, we have for the renal threshold of the sodium. So when we say renal threshold or the threshold critical value of this sodium, that means the concentration or concentration level up to which a substance, in this case the sodium, in the blood is prevented from passing through the kidneys into the urine. So that's the threshold. And for the sodium, it's 160 millimoles per liter and 120 millimoles per liter. For the hormones affecting sodium levels, generally we have two. So first, we have the aldosterone. So again, as mentioned earlier, this aldosterone has two main functions. So sodium reabsorption and potassium excretion. So that means your aldosterone would increase the sodium in the blood and it will decrease the potassium in the blood. That's why in some conditions or diseases, whenever, whenever you have a very high aldosterone, that would not only lead to increased sodium, but as well as you will have potassium wasting because of the action of this aldosterone. Next one. We have the atrial natriuretic peptide. So this is produced by the atrium of the heart and it acts as an antihypertensive agent. So this ANP has an opposite effect as compared to the aldosterone because this ANP blocks aldosterone. So that means whenever this one is released, whenever this ANP is released, this aldosterone is inhibited. So that means your ANP does the opposite of aldosterone. So it lowers sodium and it increases potassium. And aside from that, this ANP also blocks renin secretion. So remember in the RAAS, so this renin would increase the blood pressure and blood volume. But this ANP will suppress the action of renin. That's why it acts as an antihypertensive agent. Another thing, it inhibits the action of angiotensin 2 and your ADH resulting to natriuresis. So when we say natriuresis, it's the excretion of sodium in the urine. Next one for the sodium regulation. So normally it depends on the intake of water in response to thirst if there is a decrease in plasma osmolality. Next, the excretion of water, which is largely affected by ADH release and of course the blood volume status through this RAAS and atrial natriuretic peptide. Now for the clinical applications of sodium, we have the term hyponatremia. So this is defined as a sodium level below 135 millimoles per liter. And this is the most common electrolyte disorder. And clinically, if the sodium falls below 130, so 130 millimoles per liter, that is already considered as clinically significant. And we have the top causes of hyponatremia. So number one, overhydration. So in overhydration, there is a relative decrease of sodium because of increased water intake. Next one, diuretic use and abuse. So um, initially, we have two types of diuretics. So we have the thiazide, so the thiazide diuretics, and we have the loop diuretics. So the main difference between the two is that the thiazides act on the distal tubules of our nephron, whereas this loop diuretics acts on the loop of Henle itself. So if um, there is di diuretics abuse, um, this will induce um, sodium-potassium loss without interfering with ADH-mediated water retention. So that means 
in our um, ascending loop of Henle, so there is what we call as a chloride pump. So we call it as a chloride pump. So this chloride pump actively transports chloride back to the interstitium. So in short, it initiates chloride reabsorption. So it increases the chloride in our interstitium. And because sodium passively follows chloride, so there is an increased sodium level if this chloride pump is functioning well. However, if this chloride pump is blocked, for example, there's already no reabsorption of chloride to the interstitium. So that will now lead to a decrease in chloride as well as in sodium level. So if the chloride and sodium level decreases, then that would also mean a decrease in osmolality. So again, if the chloride pump is blocked, then no chloride will be reabsorbed. And since sodium passively follows chloride, then no sodium will be reabsorbed. So that will lead now to a decrease sodium and decrease chloride. And remember, sodium largely determines the osmolality of the plasma. So that means there will be a decrease osmolality. So that's in the use of diuretics. However, in this case, the ADH is not activated because the ADH release is triggered by an increased osmolality in the interstitium. So in this case, there is a decreased osmolality. So ADH will not be released. So there will be no water retention in terms of diuretics use and abuse. Next one, we have the SIADH. So that is the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. So in this case, there is increased ADH, so inappropriate ADH secretion. So if there is increased ADH or vasopressin, then a lot of water will be reabsorbed in the collecting duct, which will decrease the sodium level. Next one, we have adrenal failure. So in the RAA system, there is this um, action of angiotensin II which would um, stimulate the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. But in cases of adrenal failure, what is happening is that the adrenal cortex cannot produce aldosterone either because of tumors or destruction of the adrenal cells. So that would now lead to a decrease in sodium and increase in potassium. Remember the two functions of aldosterone. It reabsorbs sodium and it excretes potassium. Next one. Barter's syndrome. So this condition is caused by a defect in the kidney's ability to reabsorb sodium. So in this case, it's in the ascending limb. So the defect is in the ascending limb. So the ascending limb could not reabsorb sodium. And people affected by this Barter's syndrome lose too much sodium through the urine. That's why it could lead to hyponatremia. And what will happen now, because there is an incre um, I mean, a decrease in sodium in the blood because of too much losses of sodium in the urine, that will now lead to an increased aldosterone level. So again, in Barter syndrome, there is a decreased sodium reabsorption in the ascending limb. So what will happen again, that will lead to increased aldosterone. So again, what's the main function of aldosterone? It will reabsorb sodium and it will excrete potassium. So that is what I mean when I say that in some diseases such as this barter syndrome, you will have potassium wasting because you produce more aldosterone as a compensation of the losses of the sodium in the urine. That's why also the potassium will be excreted. So there will be potassium wasting. And this barter syndrome also resembles the diuretics abuse except that the decrease in sodium or hyponatremia is not corrected with fluid restriction. And next one, diabetic hyperosmolarity. So in cases of diabetes mellitus, for example, so when the osmolality of the ECF increases because of hyperglycemia, so what will happen now is that the water will go out of the cell. So, because of increased osmolality, so increased osmolality, the water 
will go out of the cell. Now, what will happen is it will lead to a dilution of serum sodium. And that is what we call as diabetic hyperosmolarity, in which for every 100 milligrams per dl, so 100 milligrams per dl, increase in serum glucose, so increase in glucose, that will now lead to um, 1.6, 1.6 MEQ per liter decrease in sodium. So that's for diabetic hyperosmolarity. So those are the top six causes of hyponatremia and their um, explanation on why we get this low sodium level. For the causes of hyponatremia, they are classified as hypovolemic, normovolemic, and hypervolemic. For the hypovolemic hyponatremia, it usually results from sodium loss in excess of water loss. That's why you have a hypovolemic state and a low sodium level in the blood. So they're classified as either renal losses or extra renal losses or cellular shift. So for the renal losses, there is usually an excretion of more than 20 millimoles per liter daily of sodium. And for the extra renal losses, it's less than 20 millimoles per day. For the renal loss, number one, we have diuretics. So as explained earlier, in the ascending loop of Henle, there is a chloride pump which actively transports um, chloride back to the interstitium. So um, the chloride is reabsorbed and since sodium passively follows chloride, the sodium is also reabsorbed back. So that's the normal mechanism. However, in the use of diuretics, what is usually hap happening is that the chloride pump, so this chloride pump is being blocked. So what happens now is there will be no chloride reabsorption. So that means the chloride is decreased. So since sodium follows the chloride, so there is also a decrease in sodium level. And because of these levels of these electrolytes, there is also a decrease in osmolality. So again, the ADH in this case is not activated, so there is no water retention. Because again, the ADH release is triggered by an increase osmolality in the interstitium, not a decrease in osmolality in the case of diuretics use and abuse. Next one, for the potassium depletion. So when the potassium is depleted, Usually, what is happening is the sodium will move into the cell as a compensation for the loss of sodium. So that's why the plasma sodium will decrease. That will also lead to hypovolemia. Next one, for aldosterone deficiency. So again, this aldosterone has two main functions. It reabsorbs sodium and it excretes potassium. So if you are deficient in aldosterone, then it follows that your sodium reabsorption is also hindered. That's why you have hyponatremia. Next one, in DM or diabetes mellitus, there is usually ketonuria. And the sodium loss occurs with this condition. So as mentioned earlier, diabetic hyperosmolarity, in which in every 100 mg per dl decrease in glucose, there is a 1.6 MEQ per liter decrease in sodium. And lastly, um, we have the salt losing nephropathy, for example, in polycystic kidney diseases. So that is an example of a renal loss. Next one, for the extra renal loss or cellular shift, so there is an excretion of less than 20 millimoles of sodium per day. So this is usually caused by vomiting, diarrhea, excess fluid loss like in burns, in sweating, and in trauma. And of course, potassium depletion could also be considered as an extra renal loss. So in these instances, thirst is stimulated by hypovolemia. So that now results in replacement by relatively more hypotonic fluid. Next one, for the normal volemic hyponatremia, we have different causes. The SIDADH, the pseudohyponatremia, this is artifactual hyponatremia severe hyperglycemia, excess water intake, and of course, adrenal insufficiency and pregnancy. 
for SIADH, there is an increased secretion of ADH. That's why we call it as the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. So if ADH or vasopressin is increased, then of course there will be retention of water. So water level is increased and that would lead now to decreased sodium level because the sodium will be diluted in the plasma because of this increased water level. And this condition, the SIAD, is usually secondary to head trauma, seizures, or um, CNS diseases, and neoplastic conditions that secrete ADH-like hormones. And this SIAD, or SIADH, normally would initiate mild hypervolemia. So first, again, there will be mild hypervolemia. So there is an increase in the water level. Next, this would trigger the release of ANP. So again, what's the function of this ANP? So remember in the previous slide, I have mentioned that, that this ANP will block the aldosterone. So if this aldosterone is being blocked, what will happen now is sodium will not be reabsorbed. So that would result to decrease sodium and of course, decrease water level. That's why you can see that there is hyponatremia and it's normovolemic. That's for SIADH. Next one, pseudohyponatremia or artifactual hyponatremia. So this can usually occur in cases of severe hyperlipidemia or hyperproteinemia. So in short, there is an increased lipids and increased proteins. So in this case, no sodium ions are dissolved in lipids, which can take up a considerable volume of serum. Therefore, the decrease of sodium in this case is relative or secondary to hyperlipidemia or hyperproteinemia. Next one, severe hyperglycemia. So again, this will induce water movement to plasma to normalize the osmolality. That's why you will develop hyponatremia. Next, excess water intake or usually the use of hypotonic fluid so this is what we call as a psychogenic polydipsia this one psychogenic polydipsia so that would lead to hyponatremia next one adrenal insufficiency so this adrenal insufficiency could decrease the aldosterone level but not only that this one leads to a decreased aldosterone and also a decreased cortisol level because your cortisol is also produced from your adrenal gland. And this cortisol inhibits the ADH release. So if the ADH is inhibited, then no water is being retained. So the initial phase of this process results in hypovolemia. However, the ADH-induced water retention typically restores volume status to normal. So that's for your adrenal insufficiency. And of course, you have pregnancy. Next one, for the hypervolemic hyponatremia, usually this is nearly always a problem of water overload. And this causes now edema. So we have acute or chronic renal failure and nephrotic syndrome hepatic cirrhosis, and congestive heart failure. And in this case, the usual therapy is water restriction. And also, sodium should not be given because it could increase the severity of edema. So for example, in congestive heart failure and also in hepatic cirrhosis, so there is an increased venous back pressure in the circulation. So that would now promote movement of fluid from the blood to the interstitium, so that will cause edema. So there is hypervolemic state. This table shows the serum and urine electrolyte patterns in common causes of hyponatremia. So in this case, there is a normal renal function. So first we have overhydration. So this is caused by a consumption of large amount of water or hypotonic fluids. And because the consumed water is excreted by the kidneys, the urine is also diluted. And you will have a clue 
if there is overhydration that is happening if you could see a triad. So a triad would mean a decreased sodium level, a decreased hematocrit values, and of course, a decreased BUN. So this result suggests oftentimes overhydration. And the potassium can also be low in this case, but it often remains within the reference range. So that's why it's normal or decreased. And because mainly water is excreted in the urine in this condition, the total 24-hour sodium excretion will also be low. Next, we have diuretic abuse. So again, in, in diuretic abuse, the loop diuretics usually block the chloride pump in the loop of Henle. So this chloride pump is necessary for water conservation. So if this pump is blocked, then what will happen is water is lost. And also, sodium is depleted because it follows chloride in the loop. And unlike overhydration, the total 24-hour sodium excretion is high. So that's in diuretic use or abuse. And also, the loop diuretics could um, result to severe potassium depletion unless you use drugs or substances that could spare potassium. Next one, we have SIADH. So in this case, the serum sodium is decreased because of excessive retention of water in the collecting ducts because of high ADH levels. And this now results in the depletion of water in the renal tubules. So that would concentrate the urine. Next, we have adrenal failure. So this is usually secondary to Addison's disease. So Addison's disease. So in this case, there is no aldosterone again. So what will happen now, the sodium and potassium in the DCT and collecting ducts, um, the exchange of those electrolytes does not occur. So what will happen, the serum sodium concentration will be decreased and the potassium is increased owing to the function of the aldosterone. And the urinary sodium also increases, in this case, so it's mildly increased as opposed to the SIADH that is very high. So that's the difference of the adrenal failure and Addison's disease. Uh, I mean the SIADH and the Addison's disease. Next one, we have the Barter's syndrome. So in this condition, it resembles diuretics use. So you can see here in the diuretics um, use or abuse, all values are decreased except the 24-hour urine sodium. So it is the same in Barter's syndrome. So the only difference is that hyponatremia is not corrected with fluid restriction in Barter's syndrome. And in this case, the kidneys of the patients fail to retain potassium. So you could see decreased potassium and also decreased sodium level. So hyponatremia accompanied by hypokalemia. Next, for diabetic hyperosmolarity. So again, when the osmolality of the ECF increases because of increased blood glucose, water will go out of the cell that would result to the dilution of serum sodium. Okay, let's have hypernatremia. So hypernatremia as opposed to hyponatremia means an increased blood sodium level. So normally, the sodium level would exceed beyond 145 millimoles per liter or 145 MEQ per liter. And we have here the several causes of hypernatremia. So it may be because of excess loss of water relative to sodium loss. Next one, decreased water intake or increased sodium intake. So for the specific causes, we have dehydration, diabetes insipidus, and hyperaldosteronism. So I have a question. So what do you think is the major defense of our body to hypernatremia and hyperosmolality? So, the major defense of our body to these conditions is the activation of thirst. 
in which the osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus will respond to the elevated blood osmolality by triggering the sensation of thirst and of course by increasing the secretion of antidiuretic hormone or ADH. So one of the main causes of hypernatremia is dehydration and there are several factors that could contribute to this condition. So first we have profuse sweating or breathing. So again, these are insensible losses and this could account for about 1 liter of water loss per day in adults. Also, we have diarrhea, severe burns, conditions that increase water level such as in fever, burns, and exposure to heat. And another one is that hypernatremia because of dehydration can occur in adults with altered mental status and also in infants because they can be thirsty but they are unable to ask for water or obtain water by themselves. And also take note that in this condition, in dehydration, the serum sodium and the urine sodium are elevated because of increased renal excretion of sodium chloride. Next cause of hypernatremia is diabetes insipidus. So this is a condition characterized by copious production of dilute urine. So when we say copious, it's high in amount or high in volume. And because there is too much excretion of water, usually the urine is diluted. And the volume of urine excreted daily is about 3 to 20 liters. And in this case, there is an absence of ADH function that results to inadequate water retention. So that means if ADH is defective, so if this one is defective, or if there are factors that contribute to loss of function of ADH, water will not be retained. That's why it will lead to an increased urine output, which is diluted. And also, in this case, the serum sodium is increased, but um, the urine sodium is decreased because of dilutional effect. So this serum sodium is increased because of um, water loss. So it's a relative increase. Next one, there are two types of diabetes insipidus, the neurogenic and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Okay, so to understand this one, we need to know first that your posterior pituitary gland is the one releasing your ADH or vasopressin. And this ADH will act on the collecting duct of the kidneys in order for that to reabsorb water. So in neurogenic diabetes insipidus, there is decreased ADH secretion. So that means for neurogenic diabetes insipidus, there is a problem in the pituitary gland. So if there is a problem in that area, meaning to say the ADH will not be released. So what will happen now? The collecting duct will not be stimulated. So water retention will not occur. So that will lead now to increased urine volume but decreased specific gravity because again of dilutional effect. So that's for neurogenic diabetes insipidus. How about for the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? So for nephrogenic DI, the pituitary gland is functioning well. So that means it could release the ADH but it's the kidney that has problem. So the collecting duct is not responsive to this ADH production. So what will happen is that this water reabsorption will also not occur. And just like your neurogenic diabetes insipidus, you will have increased urine output with decreased specific gravity. And actually, this increased urine volume and decreased specific gravity would differentiate your diabetes insipidus to your diabetes mellitus. So, in our previous discussions or in our previous lessons, diabetes mellitus has also polyuria. So, that means the urine volume is increased. But because of hyperglycemia, the specific gravity is increased. So, that mainly differentiates your DI to your DM. And next one. So, how would we def differentiate neurogenic DI to nephrogenic DI because they have the same signs and symptoms. 
So in order to differentiate them, we could um, administer vasopressin. So it's through vasopressin administration. And between the two, it's the neurogenic DI that will respond to vasopressin. Meaning to say, if the patient is given vasopressin, then this will be corrected. So vasopressin is given or ADH is given. So now the collecting duct could respond to vasopressin administration administration, and water could be reabsorbed. And this one will be corrected. But in case of nephrogenic DI, despite of the administration of vasopressin, still the kidneys are the problem. So even if you have vasopressin here, the kidney still will not respond to that um, administration of vasopressin. So still, water will not be reabsorbed. So the condition will not be corrected. So that's how we differentiate the two classifications of diabetes in CPDUS. So for hypernatremia, because of hyperaldosteronism, we have several conditions. So first, adrenal hyperplasia. So this adrenal hyperplasia is usually a genetic disorder that results from overproduction of hormones like aldosterone and cortisol. So there is hyperplasia. So anyway, the adrenal glands are triangular glands on top of our kidneys. And if we have a problem in this adrenal glands, like for example, it is undergoing hyperplasia, then usually it would result to increased aldosterone production. And in adrenal hyperplasia, if aldosterone production is increased, what will happen now is sodium will also be increased because there will be too much reabsorption of sodium. So we will have a high levels of sodium in the blood. And also, we have Cushing syndrome and disease. So this Cushing syndrome or disease, this is what we call as hypercortisolism. So that means there is an increased level of cortisol um, produced from the adrenal cortex. So remember in the previous slide, I have mentioned that this cortisol, so this one, the cortisol, will inhibit the ADH production. So once ADH is inhibited or the release of ADH is inhibited because of high cortisol, then water will not be retained. So no water retention. So that means it would result to increased sodium in the blood because of too much um, water um, excreted. So that is a type of relative increase of sodium. Next one, we have hyperaldosteronism or Kohn's disease. So this Kohn's disease is actually a primary hyperaldosteronism. So in this case, this is characterized by excessive secretion of aldosterone again. So in hyperaldosteronism or Kohn's disease, this is again caused by increased aldosterone level from the adrenal glands. So still, there will be an increased sodium reabsorption. And of course, because aldosterone excretes the potassium, the potassium will be lowered or decreased in these conditions. So normally, in this hyperaldosteronism, um, the elevated levels of aldosterone in this case cause excessive reabsorption of sodium, so the sodium level will be increased. And the person will have hypokalemia or decreased potassium level, so that is potassium wasting. So this one summarizes the serum and urine electrolyte patterns in common causes of hypernatremia. Again, there is normal renal function in this case. So we have dehydration, diabetes insipidus, and hyperaldosteronism. Now let's have another major electrolyte. So let's have potassium. So potassium is also known as kalium, and it's the major intracellular cation. And it's the chief counterbalance of sodium because remember, sodium is more abundant outside of the cell as compared to potassium which is more abundant inside of the cell. And actually, it's only 2% of potassium that circulates in the plasma. So that means most of the potassium is found inside of our red blood cells. That is the reason why even slight hemolysis would increase 
the potassium value. So in short, we should not run a specimen that is hemolyzed and is intended for potassium analysis. And also, this potassium is the single most electrolyte wherein any abnormality is life-threatening. That's why this one is also referred to as the lethal electrolyte. And next one, again, most of the potassium is found inside of the RBCs. So the concentration of potassium is 105 millimoles per liter in the RBC. So it's 23 times higher than the concentration in the plasma. And also, um, this um, electrolyte is called as a lethal electrolyte because little changes in the level of potassium could result to serious consequences because the potassium has a major effect on the contraction of the skeletal muscles and particularly on the cardiac muscles. So to make it clear, so for example, we have an increased potassium. So if potassium is increased, then what will happen now? There will be a decreased resting membrane potential of the cell. So this decreased resting membrane potential of the cell because of hyperkalemia would result now to a decreased net difference. So net difference between the RMP or the resting membrane potential of the cell and the action potential of the cell. So there is a decrease in net difference. So if the net difference is lower than the normal difference, so this would result now to increased cell excitability. So the cell excitability will be increased. So this result now to muscle weakness. So that's why hyperkalemia is very lethal to patients because it could damage your heart muscles. And also, whenever we have hypokalemia, so it is also dangerous for our heart. So for example, we have decreased potassium or hypokalemia. So as opposed to hyperkalemia, the net difference or the RMP will be increased. So the cell excitability will be decreased. So what will happen? It will result to paralysis or arrhythmia. So in both cases, in hyperkalemia and hypokalemia, the heart may cease to contract. That's why this one is referred to as the lethal electrolyte. And next one, for the reference range of potassium, it's 3.5 to 5.2 millimoles per liter or MEQ per liter. Next one, for the threshold critical value, we have 6.5 millimoles per liter for hyperkalemia and 2.5 millimoles per liter for hypokalemia. For the regulation of potassium, it is filtered at the glomerulus and is mostly reabsorbed. About 70 to 80 percent is reabsorbed by either active and passive transport mechanisms in our proximal tubules. And then also in the ascending loop of Henle, the potassium is reabsorbed together with sodium and chloride by the sodium potassium chloride transporter. So for the functions of potassium, again, this potassium is important in regulating heartbeat and muscle contraction. So it could regulate neuromuscular excitability, just like what I have discussed earlier, in which if we have hyperkalemia, for example, this will result to decreased resting membrane potential of the cell. So this decreased resting membrane potential would decrease the net difference between the RMP and the action potential. So that would result now to increase muscle excitability. So if the muscle is having this increased excitability, there will be muscle weakness. So that is a consequence of hyperkalemia. And if there is, for example, a decrease in potassium, so it will be an opposite effect. So the resting membrane potential will be increased. So what will happen now? There will be a decreased cell excitability or muscle excitability. So this means there will be paralysis or arrhythmia. So the heart may cease to contract if we have potassium, which is increased, or um, a potassium level, which is decreased. Next one, 
the potassium also regulates the intracellular fluid volume and the hydrogen ion concentration. Like for example, in hypokalemia, the potassium ions are lost from the body, right? So what will happen now as a compensation, the sodium and hydrogen ions move into the cell. So the hydrogen ions is therefore decreased in the ECF. So if the hydrogen ions is decreased in ECF, that would result to alkalosis. For specimen considerations for potassium determination, it is very important to prevent hemolysis because even slight hemolysis could increase the values of potassium. So hemolysis of 0.5% of RBC can increase potassium levels by 0.5 millimoles per liter. So there will be 30% increase in gross hemolysis. And the plasma levels of potassium are lower um, about 0.1 to 0.7 millimoles per liter as compared to serum level. So this is because of the release of platelets into the serum um, during clot formation. So when we are obtaining serum, so the platelets could be released from the cells so that would also add up to the potassium values. And next one, we have muscular activities such as um, exercise and prolonged standing. So it could increase the potassium level by 10 to 20%. So if you are doing, um, for example, mild to moderate exercise, so the potassium level could increase to 0 0.3 to 1.2 millimoles per liter. So that's for mild or moderate exercise. But if you have vigorous exercises or more particularly when you when we are taking blood samples from the patient and if we request the patient to have his or her fist clenched, so that would increase the potassium level by 2.3 millimoles per liter. So you should not tell the patient to make um, a clenched fist during blood collection methods. And of course, we have prolonged application of tourniquet. So this would lead to hemoconcentration and would increase the potassium level. And another one, prolonged contact of serum and red blood cells. So it is very important to separate the serum from red cells within 30 minutes. For the clinical applications of potassium, let's have first hypokalemia or low potassium in the blood. So the most common cause of hypokalemia is an impaired renal function. And we also have several causes such as insulin overdose, alkalosis, vomiting, renal tubular acidosis, and hyperaldosteronism. So actually, the dangers of hypokalemia are of concern in all patients, especially um, in patients who have cardiovascular disorders because um, they, could, they could have an increased risk of arrhythmias. So this condition may cause sudden death in certain patients with cardiac disorders. And also, um, the normal value of potassium is about 3.5 to 5.2 millimoles per liter or MEQ per liter. But um, a decreased level around 3.0 to 3.4, this is classified as mild hypokalemia. And for the treatment of hypokalemia, usually the patients are given um, oral potassium chloride or intravenous replacement of potassium. And for chronic cases, usually foods with high um, um, potassium content is incorporated in the diet. So like um, nuts, bananas, orange juice, and even cereals. So those are um, the things to consider for hypokalemia. So one of the causes of hypokalemia is insulin overdose, just like for example, in patients having diabetes mellitus. So just a review on the function of insulin. So if this is our blood vessels, then this is our cell. So the insulin will enable the entry of glucose from the bloodstream into the cell. So that is what we call as the cellular uptake of glucose. So if there is insulin overdose, then there will be excessive cellular uptake of glucose. As a result, there will also be influxes of potassium into the cell as facilitated by the insulin. So in short, the potassium present in the plasma will be lowered, so it will result to hypokalemia. Another cause of hypokalemia is alkalosis. So this means 
there is a decreased hydrogen ion concentration here and the pH is increased. So red blood cells are excellent buffers. They can exchange potassium for hydrogen ions. Thus, in alkalosis, hydrogen ions leave the red cells to neutralize excess base while potassium enter the red cells. So for example, this is our red blood cell. And surrounding that, we have the ECF. So of course, inside of our cells, the major cation is the potassium. But also, we have several hydrogen ions present in that red blood cells. And also outside, we could find several potassium, much lower as compared to the red cell level. And also, hydrogen ions in the ECF. So in alkalosis, so in this condition, there is again decreased hydrogen ions. So as a compensation, the hydrogen ion from the red blood cell will shift towards the outside of the cell. So hydrogen ion, which is a cation, is lost in the red blood cells. So as a replacement, the potassium will be delivered inside of the red blood cells as a replacement again for that hydrogen ion. So potassium ion here is lost, lowering it in the plasma. That's why you will have hypokalemia in cases of alkalosis. Next, hypokalemia due to vomiting. So this results to the depletion of both hydrogen and potassium ions from the stomach. So in vomiting, the decrease in potassium levels is usually the cause of um, potassium loss in the urine. And this vomiting would cause metabolic alkalosis. So that means there is an increased bicarbonate ion. So the body would tend to eliminate the bicarbonate ions from the kidneys and that will now lead to an increased excretion of bicarbonate ions which also lead to renal potassium wasting. And the next one, renal tubular acidosis. So um, in RTA, the hydrogen ions cannot be excreted into the urine because of pathologic impermeability of the DCT membrane to hydrogen ions. And remember, in DCT, both the hydrogen ions and potassium are excreted and exchanged for sodium that is reabsorbed. So again, sodium reabsorption and potassium excretion. So what is the hormone responsible for this one? So it's the aldosterone. So in the DCT, if there is impermeability to hydrogen ions, that means these ions cannot be excreted out to the urine. So it will build up in the blood causing acidosis. So that means we have a decreased pH in the blood. And now the urine will become alkaline because again, these hydrogen ions are not excreted. So how about hypokalemia? So hypokalemia results from the increased excretion of potassium to compensate for the inability to excrete hydrogen ions. So remember, hydrogen ion is a positive ion. So since it is not excreted, potassium, which is also a positive ion, will compensate for its excretion. So hypokalemia will occur in this renal tubular acidosis. Next is hyperaldosteronism. So again, increase in aldosterone level would tend to reabsorb more sodium in the blood, causing an increased excretion of potassium. That's why it would result to hypokalemia. Next one, pseudohypokalemia. So this is usually caused by leukocytosis or increased WBC count. So this leukocytosis can falsely decrease the potassium levels because these WBCs would take up the potassium. Like for example, if um, there are leukemic cells, so they actively take up these potassium levels, lowering it in the blood. And especially um, if the sample is left at room temperature. Next is hyperkalemia or increased potassium level in the blood. So this is an abnormal physiological state resulting from high concentrations of potassium. And hyperkalemia is almost always due to impaired renal excretion. So especially if you have renal failure. And the main causes of hyperkalemia include reduced aldosterone or aldosterone responsiveness 
impaired renal excretion and renal failure, and reduced distal delivery of sodium. So these elevations in serum potassium will directly stimulate aldosterone release in order to excrete potassium level. And the most common cause of chronic hyperkalemia, so chronic hyperkalemia is hyporeninemic hypoaldosteronism. So that means you have low renin levels and you have low aldosterone levels. But for hospitalized patients, the most common cause of hyperkalemia is the administration of potassium. Usually, um, the greatest risk is by um, giving the patient IV potassium replacement. For the top causes of hyperkalemia, we have hypoaldosteronism, acidosis, cellular injury, and artifactual or pseudo-hyperkalemia. So this hyperkalemia, whenever this occurs, the treatment must be started whenever the serum potassium reaches the level of 6 to 6.5 millimoles per liter or greater than this, or if the person has changes in its ECG pattern. And in order to offset the effect of potassium, which of course lowers the resting membrane potential of the heart, so calcium could be given. So this calcium will reduce the action potential of the heart and this one is just an immediate but short-lived protection to the myocardial cells against the effect of hyperkalemia. And also, sodium bicarbonate, glucose, and even insulin, this could also be administered to the patient because these substances shift the potassium back into the cells. That means they increase the cellular uptake of this potassium. And also, loop diuretics could be given to patients in order to remove the potassium out of the body. Again, hypoaldosteronism could cause increased potassium level. So in this case, there will be a decreased excretion of potassium resulting to increased serum level of it. So example, in Addison's disease. Next, in acidosis, so hydrogen ions enter the cell in exchange for potassium ions. So in short, in acidosis, usually the hydrogen ion is increased. So what will happen is that these hydrogen ions will enter the cell in order to balance the blood pH. So as exchange to that, the potassium will move out of the cell. So in short, the potassium will be increased in the ECF in cases of acidosis. Next, cellular injury. So any kind of cell damage can cause an increase in potassium level because we have to take note, potassium is highly found inside the cells. Just little values are in the ACF. And popular causes are rhabdomyolysis and, of course, particularly hemolysis. Artifactual or pseudo-hyperkalemia. So as mentioned earlier, we have hemolyzed sample, prolonged tourniquet application, excessive fist clenching, and blood stored in ice. And also, high blast counts in leukemias could cause pseudo-hyperkalemia because the blast may also lie during standard phlebotomy, um, um, phlebotomy techniques releasing the potassium. So that is also a cause of hemoconcentration of potassium. And thrombocytosis and severe leukocytosis can cause increased potassium because the potassium will be released from platelets and white blood cells, especially during blood clotting. And the use of EDTA as anticoagulant. Remember, EDTA exists as um, sodium EDTA or potassium EDTA. So we should never use this anticoagulant whenever we are examining um, blood for potassium. Next, we have the chloride. So this one, this is the major extracellular an ion and it is the chief counter ion of sodium because outside the cell the main cation is the sodium whereas the main anion is the chloride and it works with sodium in the maintenance of water balance and osmolality that is the reason why disorders of chloride are usually the same with sodium because they are both extracellular ions and also Chloride has a close relationship with bicarbonate in the maintenance of acid-base balance. And this is the only anion to serve as an enzyme activator. So for the reference range, 
For the chloride, we have 98 to 107 millimoles per liter or MEQ per liter. And take note that in heavy hemolysis, this will cause a decreased chloride value. And also the sodium will be decreased because both the sodium and chloride will be diluted during heavy hemolysis. However, slight hemolysis will not affect your sodium and your chloride unlike your potassium. One of the processes in which the chloride could maintain electroneutrality aside from being um, a rate-limiting component in sodium reabsorption is through this chloride shift mechanism. So, in this process of cellular respiration, the tissue cells here would generate carbon dioxide whenever they receive oxygen. And the carbon dioxide generated by cellular uh, metabolism within these tissues will diffuse out into the plasma, so in this area, and also into the red blood cells. And inside the red blood cells, the carbon dioxide will also combine with water to form carbonic acid. And with the help of carbonic anhydrase, this carbonic acid will be split into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. And the deoxyhemoglobin will buffer the hydrogen ion released from the carbonic acid. Whereas this um, bicarbonate ion here will diffuse out into the plasma in order to neutralize the excess acid because of this increased carbon dioxide release. And the chloride in the ECF will diffuse into the red blood cell in order to establish electroneutrality. So that is how the chloride shift mechanism works. So this table shows the causes of hyperchloremia and hypochloremia. So as I have mentioned earlier, chloride disorders are often a result of the same causes that disturb the sodium levels because again, chloride passively follows sodium. However, there are few exceptions because hyperchloremia may also occur when there is an excess loss of bicarbonate such as in GI losses, in cases of diarrhea, renal tubular acidosis, or even in metabolic acidosis. Next electrolyte is the calcium. So this electrolyte is present almost exclusively in the plasma because 99% is part of the bones and only 1% is found in the blood and in the ECF. So very little amount of calcium is found in our plasma. And also this calcium is a cofactor in blood coagulation. It's also involved in enzyme activity and excitability of skeletal and cardiac muscles. As I have mentioned earlier, this one is used in the treatment of hyperkalemia. And also, it helps in the maintenance of blood pressure. Calcium can exist as ionized, protein-bound, or complexed. So for the ionized calcium, this one circulates freely as calcium ions. So it comprises about 50% of the total calcium in the blood. And next one, we also have protein-bound calcium, which is 40%. So the calcium in this case is mostly bound to albumin. And next one, the complex forms are usually complexed with bicarbonate, citrate, phosphate, and even lactate. And out of the three forms of calcium, it's the ionized calcium that is a sensitive and a specific marker for calcium disorders. And take note that also, calcium could be bound again mostly to albumin. So, whenever there is low serum albumin, it could follow hypocalcemia. So, for every 1 gram per dl decrease in albumin, so that would result to 0 0.8 milligrams per dl decrease in total calcium. So, that's for hypocalcemia because of reduced albumin level in the blood. These are the substances that help in the regulation of calcium in the blood. So first, the active vitamin D. So it's the 125-dihydroxycholicalciferol. Also, we have the parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. So out of the three, it's only the calcitonin that lowers the blood calcium level. And the two of these, they are responsible for hypercalcemia. This diagram shows the hormonal response to hypercalcemia and hypocalcemia. So in this illustration, we could see that the parathyroid hormone secretion 
is stimulated by hypocalcemia, whereas whenever there is hypercalcemia, PTH is not secreted. And this PTH has three major effects on the kidneys and on the bone. So in the bone, this PTH will stimulate bone resorption. So there will be osteoclastic activity in which the osteoclast will break down the bone so it would result to increase calcium level in the ECF. And on the kidneys, the PTH can conserve calcium by increasing its tubular reabsorption. And another one, this PTH can also stimulate the renal production of vitamin D. So remember that this vitamin D3 that we obtained from the diet or exposure of skin to sunlight is still in its inactive form. And this vitamin D3 will be converted to 25 hydroxycholicalciferol, this one. So this is in the liver. But take note, it is still inactive. So, once it reaches the kidneys, that is where it will have its biologically active form. So, that means in the kidneys, the vitamin D3 will be activated. And this active form of vitamin D3 is what we call as the 125-dihydroxycholicalciferol. And the action of this is towards the intestine, where, where it could promote intestinal absorption of calcium and phosphate and also in the kidneys that it could promote renal absorption of calcium and also phosphate. Now this one summarizes the functions of the active vitamin D, the dihydroxycholicalciferol. So it increases the intestinal absorption of calcium, it increases the reabsorption of calcium in the kidneys, and it increases the mobilization of calcium from the bones or it activates the process of bone resorption. For the PTH, it conserves calcium also by increasing its reabsorption in the kidneys. It also activates the process of bone resorption in which um, the level of calcium is being um, increased through mobilization from the bone and it suppresses the urinary loss of calcium and again, it stimulates the conversion of inactive vitamin D to active vitamin D3 in the kidneys. And lastly, we have the hormone calcitonin. So out of the three, it is calcitonin which is considered as hypocalcemic because its action is it inhibits the PTH and vitamin D3. And take note that this calcitonin is produced by the parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland. And unlike your PTH and active vitamin D3, it inhibits bone resorption and it does not reabsorb calcium. Um, actually, it promotes urinary excretion of calcium. Now, this one summarizes the causes of hypocalcemia. So, particularly, we have here alkalosis. So, the alkalosis causes plasma proteins to have a greater negative charge. So, whenever there is alkalosis, there is a decrease in hydrogen ion concentration. So, that means we have a lesser cations in the plasma. So, if this is your protein, what will happen now is this protein will be more on negative charge. So, what will happen is that it will bind more calcium ions. Remember, calcium is positively charged. So, what will happen is that the calcium will be decreased. Next one, of course, vitamin D deficiency. That could result to also hypocalcemia. Next, primary hypoparathyroidism. So there is a decreased level of parathyroid hormone secretion and also in this case, the kidney could excrete more um, calcium levels out of the blood. Also, we have acute pancreatitis, hypomagnesemia, malabsorption syndrome, and renal tubular failure. For hypercalcemia, we have primary hyperparathyroidism as the main cause in which a lot of tumors could produce um, PTH-like um, substances that could bind to normal PTH receptors and can cause increased cal calcium levels. Also, like cancers, acidosis as opposed to alkalosis. Increased vitamin D, multiple myeloma, sarcoidosis, hyperthyroidism, and milk alkali syndrome. So next electrolyte is the phosphate. So this electrolyte is omnipresent in its distribution because 
is found in the bones and 15% is in the ECF in the form of inorganic phosphate. And take note of this one. Phosphate is inversely related to calcium okay, because of the action of the parathyroid gland. Next one, for the reference range, it's 2.7 to 4.5 for adults and 4.5 to 5.5 mg per dl in children. So, this inorganic phosphorus exists as either organic phosphate or inorganic phosphate. So, the organic phosphate is the principal anion within the cell, whereas the inorganic phosphate is part of the buffer in our blood. And this one, most phosphate in the serum is in inorganic form. Next, there are factors affecting phosphate concentration such as the PTH, calcitonin, and growth hormone. So this one. So let's have first the PTH. So in the PTH, again, because of its action, calcium and phosphate is inversely related. So meaning to say, if the calcium is increased, the phosphate will be decreased or vice versa. So as what you can notice here, in the gastrointestinal tract, there is increased absorption of both calcium and phosphate. So both calcium and phosphate is increased by the action of the gastrointestinal tract as stimulated by the release of parathyroid hormone. And also in the bones, there is an increased bone resorption wherein the calcium and the phosphate could leak into the plasma. So in the stimulation of the bones, so the PTH could increase the calcium and phosphate level. However, this calcium and phosphate will have an inverse relationship because in the kidneys, the PTH could trigger the reabsorption of calcium but the phosphate is excreted. So that's why again, they are inversely related. Next one, for the calcitonin, it lowers the calcium and phosphate level. So in the GI tract, it decreases the absorption of calcium and phosphate. Also in the kidneys, it decreases the reabsorption of both electrolytes. And in the bone, it inhibits bone resorption, which would promote um, the shift of calcium and phosphate into the bones. And lastly, we have the active vitamin D3. So this um, active vitamin D3 will increase calcium and phosphate. So by increasing the reabsorption of these electrolytes in the gastrointestinal tract and also increasing bone resorption, and in the kidneys also, these electrolytes are reabsorbed. So phosphate deficiency can lead to ATP depletion. And the transcellular shift is a major cause of hypophosphatemia. So that means an increased shift of phosphate into the cells can deplete phosphate in the blood. And once it is taken up by the cells, it remains there to be used in the synthesis of phosphorylated compounds. Another one. The equilibrium between serum phosphatases and intracellular phosphate stores is determined largely by carbohydrate metabolism and also blood pH. Next one, in renal disease where tubular failure occurs, the phosphate excretion is inhibited by um, the tubules which is not responsive to PTH. So in this case, the phosphate level will increase while the calcium level will fall. Next, increased serum phosphate causes serum tubular failure. And next one, severe hypophosphatemia will result to plasma concentration of less than 1 gram per dl or 0.3 millimoles per liter. And this table summarizes the causes of hyperphosphatemia and hypophosphatemia. Next, we have magnesium. So magnesium is the second most abundant intracellular cation so this is second to potassium and also it's the fourth most abundant cation in the body and it's also an enzyme activator so majority of the magnesium is stored in the bones so it's 53 percent 46 percent in the muscles and soft tissues and only one percent in the serum and rbc's but again it's the second most abundant cation inside of the RBC, although it's only 1%. For the reference ranges, we have 1.2 to 2.1 MEQ per liter or millimoles per liter. Next one, this magnesium is a vasodilator 
and it could cause decreased uterine hyperactivity in eclampsic states and could increase uterine blood flow. So life-threatening symptoms can occur if the serum level of magnesium reaches 5 millimoles per liter and the magnesium loss leads to a decreased intracellular potassium level. So this magnesium regulates the movement of potassium across the myocardium as well. Next one, these are the factors affecting magnesium levels in the blood. So first, the PTH. So just like um, the action of um, PTH in calcium, the PTH could also increase the magnesium level by increasing its renal absorption and intestinal absorption. For the aldosterone and thyroxine, they increase the renal excretion of magnesium. So that means they lower the magnesium level in the blood. And this one summarizes the causes of hypermagnesemia and hypomagnesemia. Lastly, we have the bicarbonate ions. So it's the second most abundant anion in the ECF. So actually, it's second to chloride. And it accounts for 90% of the total carbon dioxide at physiologic pH. And this bicarbonate ion is the major component of the buffering system in the blood. This is very important in the regulation of the acid-base status of the patient. So you will learn a lot of that when we reach our discussion in the arterial blood gas analysis. And also, bicarbonate buffers excess hydrogen ions by combining with acid. And for the reference range, we have 21 to 28 MEQ per liter or 21 to 28 millimoles per liter. So these are the mechanisms and causes of increased bicarbonate concentration in the ECF. That ends my discussion. Thank you so much.